One time I had a friend who had just returned from a trip to Vegas. His big complaint was that he had lost a bunch of money because some dealer had enforced what in his mind at least was an unfair rule about placing a bet. The fairness of the rule was actually irrelevant. He had forgotten that the whole point of the casino was for him to lose money and the casino to gain money. The mistake was going to the casino in the first place. It looks like a certain segment of Cardano is also learning that lesson right now. Ready? Let's go. Today, we're going to discuss the casino problem in crypto and even in Cardano and why I hope it wasn't a problem for you, the big atomic wallet hack, an indicator of where we are in the crypto interest cycle, and some more Cardano metaverse game footage. If you find this image troubling because the hazard sign seems to be indicating there is a danger of pine trees growing on the freeway, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool. Ticker AOS. I think a lot of people in crypto have been a bit like this frog here lately. If this post is to be believed, uh, what's going on here is that some male frogs have kind of a trial and error method in terms of finding a mate. And they'll just wait until something comes along that has an appropriate amount of movement and maybe, you know, very slightly matches the right pattern. And then they'll just kind of clasp on, hoping that might be <laughs> that might be the opportunity that takes them to their goal. I think this is a little bit like what happens with gambling. I think a lot of people who gamble, they sort of know that there's a lot of movement of money that happens in casinos. There's a lot of money changing hands in casinos. And that part sounds good because they would like money to change hands into their pockets. They might even understand that most of that movement of money is out of the pockets of people just like them, players in the casino just like them. Money is flowing out of the pockets of those players into the coffers of the casinoers, into the accounts of the casino. Unfortunately, they also know of noteworthy examples of that flow reversing of players making sizable amounts of money at the casino. And of course, that's what keeps them coming back. That glimmer of hope that they could be, you know, that, that, uh, you know, very occasional person who makes a bunch of money at the casino. That's why they want to go back to the casino. And some of them might even, you know, explain it in terms of, you know, their, losses, you know, due to the house edge, the obvious house edge at casinos, they might even understand that they're sort of, that's sort of their, you know, the entrance price for them to sit around in the casino and have a night of entertainment and free or cheap drinks. They might even understand that part and rationalize it that way. But the thing that's true is that there is definitely a house edge and the only way for them to have a good probability of not losing money in the casino is to not step foot in the casino. This same thing is true in crypto, except in crypto, it's much worse for a very specific reason. In crypto, we have the certain genre of project and these projects self-admittedly are not trying to create any real utility. They're going to sell you an asset and it could be fungible or non-fungible. And the idea is that everybody's just gonna kind of cross their fingers and hope that that's the asset where number goes up because there will be a whole bunch of other projects just like that one whether it's fungible or non-fungible because we saw this too with a lot of pfp nft projects not really creating any real utility it's just hey we know there's a lot of projects like us but we think we're the one and we hope you think we're the one where numbers gonna go up and then everybody sort of buys in the project and just hopes number goes up. This sounds a lot like, you know, these games of chance available in traditional casinos. It's sort of also, you know, like the players know that chances are, you know, whatever they gamble on, you know, probably not going to be a winner, but it could be, it could be because 
We have these noteworthy examples in the past where somebody made a whole bunch of money and that hope alone is enough to get people to participate just like with the casinos. But in crypto, it's far, far worse because in those casinos, you have a pre-established set of rules. The player comes in, the dealer is there representing the casino, and there's a pre-established set of rules. Sometimes there's confusion about the rules. Sometimes the player sort of discovers you know, discovers the rules as they play or discovers that there's something about the rules that they didn't understand, you know, but there is supposed to be at least a pre-established set of rules. And in places like Vegas, there's even a gaming commission that, you know, makes sure that certain rules, you know, certain rules are, are adhered to that kind of thing. In crypto, we don't have that. <laughs> in crypto, a project just sort of pops up and they say, hey, we're going to sell you this type of asset. And the community who's going to buy that asset, they may have certain expectations about what the rules are going to be with that project and that asset and the issuance of that asset, just based on the way things have happened in the past with similar projects. But the project doesn't usually make any promises. They don't usually, I mean, they might make some, but they don't make many promises as to what they're going to do or what the rules are going to be. So then in crypto, we end up in the situation where the community has an expectation about what the rules are going to be. And then of course, the project deviates from those rules. And there are a whole bunch of different types of deviations that might happen. It could be that the people involved with the project are actually competing with the, the, the retail community, they're competing with them. And sometimes the insiders have an unfair advantage. Sometimes, you know, they get their, they get the asset, you know, before retail can get it. And they're sort of already selling the asset before retail can even get their hands on it, you know, or sometimes the insiders can even acquire special tools. Sometimes they can even acquire special tools that give them an even greater edge over retail. That's always when the community gets really mad at the project and they go to the project and say, hey, you broke the rule. And the project says, what rule? We never agreed to any rule. <laughs> and then there, there are these problems. But think about it. Would you ever go to the casino where you walk up to the table you know, and you think you're going to play blackjack and then halfway through the game, the rules of blackjack kind of change. And you say to the dealer like, hey, hey, wait a second, this is blackjack. The rule is, you know, the following thing happens next. And the dealer's like, oh, oh, well, no, we never agreed to your blackjack rules or even the blackjack rules that, you know, every other casino might be using. This is our version of blackjack. <laughs> we never agreed to any rule set. In fact, we could just change. We can just change the rules right now because we're we're the dealer. There were no rules. We just agreed that we would have a card game with you. We never we never even agreed that it was blackjack. Really, that was just your perception. <laughs> you would never go to this casino. You would never set foot inside that casino. I think the only way, even with a normal traditional casino, the only way to guarantee you don't lose money is not to set foot inside the casino. But you should probably, if you're afraid of losing money, which everybody should be, you should probably not ever set foot in these crypto casino projects where there are no rules. If, if there's already a house edge when there are rules, you definitely shouldn't set foot in the casino where the project doesn't agree to any rules. By the way, I'm not saying you should choose more wisely which of those types of projects you gamble on. I'm saying you shouldn't gamble on any of those projects. You should not step in that casino whatsoever. Speaking of not gambling, in the latest installment in the saga of you should put your crypto on hardware wallets and not on not in software wallets, I know that got a little more complicated with the recent ledger thing, but still... I'm still saying you should put your crypto in hardware wallets, not in software wallets. It looks like the Atomic Wallet, which is a very popular wallet, it's been a very popular wallet for a while, the Atomic Wallet has been hacked, and it's a pretty large hack. People lost amounts of money that would be life-changing for 
you know, if, if 20 people lost the combined amount that single people have lost here, it would be life changing for all 20 of those people. So Zach XBT has done a nice thread on this. So at first he said, it looks like the largest single victim that he found was 2.8 million USDT. So 2.8 million tether. So 2.8 million US dollars. Then he sort of, we find him kind of revising that, you know, he makes some observations or already phishing scammers already trying to send fake tweets, you know, from atomic wallet to, uh, to victims to prey on the victims, which is pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, then he says, it looks like total losses have surpassed 14 million, um, then he estimates 20 million has been stolen. Uh, then he says the new largest individual loss was 3.5 million. And he's going to revise that even higher. A new largest victim was found on Tron with 7.95 million USDT. So think about this. A, he's saying a single person, a single party at least, a single party lost almost $8 million in this hack. This is this is pretty incredible. People were were storing. Uh, people had exposure to this atomic wallet hack to the tune of eight million dollars. He says the five biggest losses accounted for seventeen million. He said his graph has now surpassed thirty five million in total stolen. So this was a giant hack, and this is another one of those cases. If you expose yourself to the risk of a single point of failure like a single software wallet provider like this. It's it's always the same. Uh, these single points of failure, everything's fine until one morning everybody wakes up and it's not fine. People sort of get lulled into the sense of complacency, like everything's safe there. There's never been a hack there. Yes, true. That's always true. There has always never been a hack until the first hack <laughs> for any single point of failure. It's always never been hacked until it's first hack. And if, you know, unfortunately we've seen this over and over again, if it's a software based single point of failure that is, you know, online or accessible to the world, it's like at some point on the timeline, there could be a hack. And here we're seeing that again with Atomic the atomic wallet. So do not rely on software wallets, even despite all of the controversy with Ledger recently, I you, you're still better off in a hardware wallet than you are in a software wallet. You can still lose your money in a hardware wallet. You could still screw up and accidentally expose your your uh, your seed phrase to someone, but I think you are better in a hardware wallet than you are in a software wallet still. If you're wondering why are things still so dead, here's the Google Trends page for Cardano. And you can see interest in Cardano is just very, very low from uh, this period from 2018 all the way up until about December of 2020. We saw nothing but very, very low interest in searching for Cardano. And now we are not, you know, not quite as low as we were back in those days, but we're still uh, extraordinarily low compared to this peak of activity in between, you know, December 2020 ish and, you know, wherever you want to stretch it out to here in 2022 and early in uh, early 2022. We're just in that part of the cycle where there's not a lot of interest in crypto in general. And you can see it's not just Cardano. If we change the search to crypto, we get a very similar graph for the past five years. And if we go out to the 2004 to present, we can see this is, in fact, a cycle. You see like very uh, small amounts of interest. In fact, there was no crypto out here. So when people were searching for crypto, they were searching in the pre-Bitcoin era back here. But then even after we get into the Bitcoin era, very little interest. And then you'll have a huge peak in interest. And then you'll have a drop in interest and another huge peak in interest. Obviously, we're just in that part of the cycle where there's very low interest in crypto generally. Looks like Cornucopia has dropped some more gameplay footage for us. I like to keep track of what these metaverse projects are doing. 
Um, I think so far we've really only seen sort of the birth and planning phases of these projects. Like obviously we had previous crypto metaverse projects like Decentraland and Sandbox, but this era of metaverse projects and especially in Cardano, we've really only seen sort of the dreaming up of these projects. And like I always say, any one of these metaverse projects in Cardano or anywhere else in crypto could fail at any time. We really don't know which ones of these projects are going to deliver on what we're hoping they're going to deliver on. Any one of them could fail, but I'm excited to see what these projects might become, especially since we were sort of there for the dreaming, dreaming up of them, but I'm excited to see what they actually become. I hope you had a great weekend and I'll talk to you tomorrow.